Elvis Presley's Heartbreak Hotel, one of the most important songs in rock and roll. A little story behind it. It was written in 1955 by the same person who introduced him to Colonel Tom Parker, a, a, a Ms. Axton. Now, she wrote the song, she had some help, came to him, said there's a great song about being brokenhearted, and Elvis took it. He recorded first hit with RCA, and it brought him to a bigger audience than he ever had with Sun Records. Truly a landmark in rock and roll history. But I have to ask a question. Is it entirely original? I'm going to say that the lyrics totally are. There's a, uh, an urban legend that there's a suicide note that either inspired part or all of the lyrics. We haven't been able to find that note or any record of it. It's likely that they just heard a story about somebody who was very heartbroken and thought, wow, what if there was a hotel for people like that that they could go to so as to not you know, do themselves any outright harm, blah, blah, blah. Here we go. Got a song. Hey, Elvis, try it. And they went with that. Okay, so the lyrics, like I said, they're they're original. But what about the music? Is that entirely original? Well, I'm gonna take you back in time. Let's let's go back from 1955 when the song was written, back to 1950 in a different time, and let's have a listen to this little tune. Yeah, that's Double Cross and Blues by Little Esther singing with the Johnny Otis Quintet. And you can you can hear it right there. You, you, you can pause the video, go back and play through it and sing the words for Heartbreak Hotel right on top of that. And until you get to the chorus part, the, the I, I, you know, I feel so lonely I could die part, that doesn't quite match. But the main verse, dun da dun da 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 dun da 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 Boom! There it is. You can sing it right on top of that because it is the same tune. Would we have had Heartbreak Hotel had it not been for Johnny Otis Quintet doing the Double Crossing Blues with featuring Little Esther, America's new blues sensation? I don't think we would have because there it is. There's the music right there in 1950. Was there a lawsuit? Absolutely! But Nobody sued Elvis or RCA or Ms. Axton or anybody involved with that Heartbreak Hotel. No, the actual lawsuit was against Johnny Otis from the original writer of the song because, well, Johnny Otis claimed credit for it and put it on all the <laughs> all the records and was getting royalties from that. And the original writer says, no, no, no. If you're going to do my entire song, I say no. So why didn't that songwriter sue Elvis or RCA or anybody or Colonel Parker, whoever, anybody? Why not? Well, the question is, was that the same song? It has different lyrics. So, no. But then there was another case, and this happened right before Elvis's recording of this song. Uh, there was, it, it, At Sun Records... There was a performer, Rufus Thomas. He later went on to do the, the Funky Chicken over at Stax. Great guy. Well, he did a song called Bearcat, where he wrote new lyrics for Hound Dog. You, know, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. Well, he said, you ain't nothing but a bear cat. And the author of Hound Dog sued Sun Records so hard that... Sam Phillips is going, well, how am I going to pay this off? And then RCA says, we'd like to buy Elvis's contract. And yes, I can, if I sell Elvis, I'll be able to pay off this lawsuit. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, joy. So we have a case of a song where it's got completely different lyrics, but the same tune getting sued and this lawsuit having merit. So why didn't it happen in this case? 
Well, there's a couple of dynamics. Number one, I think, on the list is this is 1956 America. It's got segregation. It's got a very negative attitude towards African Americans. And if they are going after a white guy with a big record label, it might not work out so well. There's a chance there. There's also a chance that the author of this song, although they were mad at Johnny Otis for claiming credit, felt, well, Elvis changed the tune slightly and it's totally new lyrics. Maybe I don't have a case or maybe I don't want a case or maybe I think it's different enough. I, I don't care. I'm fine with it. We don't know. We don't have a record of that, or at least I haven't found one. But I do have something very interesting in this Cashbox magazine. And by the way, you can find them online in PDF format. If you like digging through old magazines, oh, here they are. And they don't stack up in a corner because they're electronic. I love it. But digging through these Cashbox magazines, even in the 40s, they're complaining about uh, bootlegs about people taking records and making illegal copies of them and selling them and getting all the profit and none of it going back to the artist or the label or the distributor or anybody else in that chain. Bootlegs were a big issue then. That's the kind of copying they're really worried about. Never mind somebody else is performing it. If, if they're actually making a copy and selling it, that's what we want to go after. And that's where they wanted to have a little more teeth in the copyright law because it really wasn't going after those guys as well as they thought it could. Most of the copyright law in America at this time was, again, it was written back in 1912, or an update of the 1908 one. It, it was dealing mostly with sheet music and how it related to player pianos and whether people should be compensated off of that or not. But it had it, it, this recording business really hadn't taken off then. The law had to be bent to make it fit what was going on and it didn't always fit right another thing that would happen if you again go back to the cash boxes and you will see how they'll list how certain songs are popular in a market and then all the people performing them and you may have two three four sometimes five or six different versions of a record and it's not always like here's the black version and here's the white guy doing a cover version you can have different white guys, different black guys, different, you know, whoever else guys doing their versions, each trying to sell. And why would that be? Well, part of the answer you can see in this ad. If you look, you see Johnny Otis recording a double crossing blues featuring little Esther. All right, underneath that, it says limited distributor territories available. So, there's a limited supply of these records. They're, they make them and then that's it. They got to move on to the next one. And you'll see that this leads to other artists deciding, well, we're going to do our version of that song and we're going to sell it. And that's that. People want to buy the song and there's not enough of the other one. This actually happened in, in a very celebrated way in 1972. There was a, a group out of uh, uh, Cameroon in Africa a very popular one, and they had a song called Sol Makosa. Well, the very few copies of this record made their way to the USA, and those that did got bought by DJs, and they were playing the heck out of that tune. It's a great funk song, and people wanted it, but they didn't have a version in America, so other bands had to go and get in the studio and record it and put their version out. When they ran out, somebody else recorded it. This is happening all the way up into the 70s. Could that have been something happening here with Heartbreak Hotel? Maybe. Again, we don't know. But it's part of the musical scene that you have these musicians outright doing another song. But as long as you credit the songwriter, well, all well and good. The songwriter gets their money for it. It's the song, not the performance, that was the big deal with the copyright law. Unless it was a bootleg record, and then, okay, the performance does have a we'll say in it. It gets complicated, real complicated. But it, it's also, you realize it is formative. Even in this late date in the 50s, they don't always have a law to go with the incident. But we here can hear it, and we really should give credit to these early blues and jump blues and other pop music performers on the R&B circuit back in the early 50s and late 40s, these were people that Elvis was listening to. And it may have been when Elvis heard Heartbreak Hotel, he may have been thinking, hey, 
That's a warmed over version of Double Cross and Blues. I remember that in 1950, March of 1950, in fact. He was very, very literate in this kind of music. He, might, he very well would have known and felt like, okay, this is good material. It's nice and bluesy. I can handle it. We'll rock it up a little, get an echo chamber going. But yeah, it, this is a sound, sound song to build a career on. But you should explore back there as well. There's lots of material that gets redone and later in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, even 80s and 90s. You will find bits and pieces of these songs coming forward in the modern day. It's amazing. Feel free, go back and explore. Not everyone's going to be a winner, but the ones you find, you're going to go, oh, that's a good one. So I hope you keep digging. And remember, every time you hear Heartbreak Hotel, you can smile to yourself and say, hey guys, try Double Crossing Blues by Little Esther and see if it don't sound similar. <laughs> and they'll think you're a musical genius. And why not? You will be if you quote that fact. I'll give you more rock and roll history in the next one. Have a great day and stay cool, cats. <laughs>